Welcome to Women Working in Wealth from the American College Center for Women in Financial Services. Join us as we showcase unique career opportunities and dispel myths surrounding the financial services profession through conversations with industry leaders. We are here for another episode of Women Working in Wealth. I'm your host, Lindsay Lewis. We are thrilled to have Sloan Ortel as our featured guest today. Sloan is the founder of Invest Vegan, which is an ethics first RIA. She also co hosts the Free Money Podcast. Because of her thought leadership, she is blazing new trails in FinServe. Let's jump into our conversation with Sloan. I am so excited to be here. I was listening to a couple of the earlier episodes earlier today and really enjoying it. It's a great company to be in. We are thrilled to have you. And we just would love for you to tell us more about yourself and how you got to where you're at. Sure. Like, so I, I think, you know, in some ways, my participation in the financial services industry was like involuntary. Both my parents were investment professionals. Mommy was a bond salesperson and trader, and daddy was an investment banker and private equity manager. And so, you know, they didn't have the greatest marriage. And so really one of the few things that they could like talk about was investing in finance. And so the benefit of that, like sort of on long car rides where you know, I guess there wasn't really anything else to talk about. So my dad would talk about how he was like restructuring a French scales company or like, you know, an Irish trash, trash collections business. And my mom would talk about like the stuff that they were doing on refinancing electric utilities and, and, and lowering costs of debt and stuff like that. So my mom likes to joke or like to joke, she passed away a couple of years ago, that I learned the difference between debt and equity before I could ride a bike, which is like completely true. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, and as everyone listening can tell, I was like the coolest kid ever, obviously, and very well adjusted. Um, but, you know, I, I sort of got into the industry after, you know, my, my dad's firm kind of blew up around the 2007 financial crisis. And I had graduated from high school. I was looking to go to college. And all of a sudden, we had no money. <laughs> uh, like no is in zero. And I needed a job. And I, you know, sort of managed to talk my way into an internship at Oppenheimer and Company, which I'm still very grateful for. They got me registered. I passed my Series 7 about three months into that. And then shortly after that, I started working with clients, you know, and it was like this really interesting context where I had just had the personal implications of poor financial planning made very clear to me. <laughs> um, you know, and at the same time, the world was blowing up. So I was sort of in between dealing with my own emotional pain and finding ways to, I, I guess, chart a path for my, myself, but also like, you know, listening to people who are dealing with very analogous struggles, right? Where, you know, a grandmother had wanted to pay college tuition for her grandkid and put some money into this sort of structured note that was meant to be as good as cash, but then post the failure of Lehman, it was not quite as good as cash. And, you know, situations like that abounded in my day-to-day -day life early on. And I sort of got this sense at a deep level that the industry needed to do a lot of work at fitting itself into what people actually cared about, right? I didn't know exactly what they needed to do, right? I just knew that something was wrong and I really needed to get into a context where people were, were engaging earnestly with that. And that sort of led me to CFA Institute, where I spent the bulk of my career, you know, sort of as, I guess, a dork in what you would call like the research division of a normal organization, but uh, what, what they called sort of member content and services. So I was really kind of looking into things that were likely to hit the CFA curriculum, you know, kind of like three to 10 years from now, like crypto, like ESG, sustainable investing, so on and so forth. And, you know, trying to kind of digest it down and help our members stay abreast of what was going on with it. So that really was like my formative experience. That is such an interesting journey. I feel as though a lot of people that get into financial services have a similar money story in the sense of something happens, some sort of crisis or thing like that. And they go through that experience and they're like, I am committed to making sure nobody else goes through that experience. And it seems like that was somewhat of the catalyst for you and obviously the foundation of your, your parents' dynamic. I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about the CFA Institute and what that is and what does it mean to be a CFA? I know at the college, we have nine different designation and the CFA doesn't fall here at the college, but curious, like who does the CFA serve? That's a great question. I mean, like I would say the history of CFA Institute is sort of enmeshed existentially with the history of investment management in the United States. You know, the CFA Institute as an organization has its roots in like, there's this like one weird guy, Ben Graham, 
who is you know notable to a lot of people as being the professor that taught Warren Buffett at Columbia Business School. But he wasn't just a professor, he was also sort of a community organizer. And back when, you know, what we would now call an investment analyst was called a statistician because there wasn't like a widely acknowledged empirical link between the accounting performance of a company and their stock market performance, right? Like that, you know, Ben Graham was kind of like, hey, I think that these financial statements actually have something to do with what these stocks do and that we can interpret them in interesting ways. And, you know, there was sort of a subculture that was built around that that grew into the CFA designation over time. Like it sort of started as a lunch club at, I'm forgetting the name of the restaurant, but it was like it's an iconic New York City restaurant. They would like go up on the top floor and, you know, have a steak dinner. And that grew into the, the 1960s where, you know, about 300 people took this designation for the first time. There's an interesting diversity and inclusion wrinkle there, which is a lot of people don't really think about when it comes to designations, but you know, Ben Graham was, was Jewish. And at, at the time, you know, being Jewish was like a big deal on Wall Street. A lot of the firms were like explicitly WASP firms. And so one of the big intentions of the CFA designation was to help it be obvious to clients that the person they were getting their advice from had actually gone through some kind of training, you know, but beyond that, there's also this wrinkle of like, okay, so this is a series of exams that anyone, regardless of their background, or their breeding can take and demonstrate that they have the qualifications of anybody else, right? And so, you know, from 1960 to 1980, that was kind of a sleepy thing to do, right? Because, you know, the markets were kind of sleepy back, you know, the, the 1960s, not many people owned retail mutual funds, not many people were investing in stocks, cut forward to the 1980s, and you have this remarkable growth in both the professionalization and the size of the financial markets, right? And so concurrently with that, the CFA Institute expanded from being like 11 people in a farmhouse in Virginia to having local societies in more countries than McDonald's, right? So my role at the CFA Institute, I was sort of like trying to get interesting stuff out of people at CFA Sri Lanka, at CFA Czech Republic, at CFA Brazil, Argentina, wherever, you know, these communities of financial analysts who, you know, are probably like they're dealing with markets that are nothing like the US, you know, and they're navigating realities that are completely unfamiliar to a lot of people. Like, you know, for instance, in Bangladesh, when I went there, you know, they didn't have an interest rate, like a government, a government bond interest rate that was observable at all, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, if you think about financial modeling, like that's a big deal. It plays into a lot of things. So there's a lot of really interesting community stuff there. And I, I think that, you know, my model for CFA Institute more broadly is that it's like a really good place to get, you know, connection to a community of other financial analysts. But who are those financial analysts, right? Like, I think, you know, people listening to this might, you know, kind of go, okay, well, you know, there are a lot of letters that people can get after their names. CFA is one of them. CFP is another one of them. And then the American College does a great job kind of, you know, going deeper and broader, and, and, you know, and kind of tailoring designations that are a little bit more specific to given roles. The CFA is kind of like, becoming a samurai, I guess. It's like three years of work and it takes literally 1,000 hours. And my advice to people who think about it is do not even try if you don't have 1,000 hours <laughs> to, to think about this, right? It goes into, you know, it's like a maybe a two and a half foot stack of textbooks that you need to basically memorize over the course of that time. And that covers basically anything that you could encounter in the markets from crypto to corporate bonds and corporate finance to, you know, the fundamentals of ethics and governance, you know, so I think that there are some pretty substantial ethical code commonalities between the CFA designation and the other stuff that, you know, might be out there for people to think about. But I would caution that like for folks who are more interested in working with people, for folks who are more interested in specific aspects of a client's planning journey, or maybe want a more modular approach to education. There are a lot of things that you can do that don't necessarily, you know, take up the next three years of your life. You know, I, nothing against the CFA there. It's just, you know, it's important to have to chart your own path through these things. I think you bring up some great points when looking through designations is the time commitment and also what's my end goal here, right? So if I went down this path of CFA and I wanted it to be client facing, working with certain affluent client types, like perhaps that would be 
not the direction I want to go. But if I really want to get into the nitty gritty of fundamental analysis or into, you know, building portfolios, then perhaps that direction I need to go, which leads me to my next question, because I am obsessed with your platform. So tell us a little bit more about Invest Vegan and what does it, like, what do you do? I think my life partner would love the answer to what do I do as much as anyone. So Invest Vegan is an ethics first investment advisor right now. So what, what does that mean? Well, when you think about sustainable investing, a lot of it is, you know, intensely relative, right? You know, and every time something happens in the world, like let's say hypothetically Russia invades the Ukraine, people start revisiting a lot of stuff. And then you see articles like, well, is oil really sustainable? Is arms manufacturing sustainable? Like, you know, are these responsible things to be investing in? And I think that that can really lead a lot of investors to get whipsawed because there's sort of this impression that there's no constancy to, you know, ethical investing. And, you know, it's really this problem that is so out there that we couldn't possibly solve it. Well, you know, as a practical matter, there actually are lines in the sand. And, you know, I, I'm a vegan and, you know, for me, killing animals is bad and I don't want to do that or anything like it. And it's actually possible to make a big list of the things that you think are bad, which I've done, and then go, okay, let's take out from our consideration every company that matches, every investment opportunity that matches, every debt fund, every lender, whatever, that causes these red sorts of red flags to come up. And then you look around and say, all right, so what now? And that's really what I'm engaged in in Invest Vegan day to day is like the, okay, so what now, right? Because, you know, all of the realities that interface with our clients and our, you know, the people that we talk to, like the and investors, you know, like interest rate rises, inflation, all these like macroeconomic things that apply to everyone also apply to ethical investors, but we're dealing with a different universe, right? So we need different ways of building portfolios. And so what I've done at Invest Vegan is found innovative ways to combine, you know, what I would consider pure risk assets, right? Like I have a portfolio that's very similar to like a mutual fund that's accessible in separate accounts on hopefully soon on Schwab, but right now on Altruist, that is my best shot at capturing the returns available to people who might invest in quote unquote stocks. And then I have an ability to blend that with investments in real estate and infrastructure assets to reduce risk, right? So traditionally people would use something like bonds for that, for a variety of reasons that are kind of outside of the scope of this podcast, not the greatest idea and not the easiest thing to do sustainably. So what I've found is a way to combine those two things into portfolios that work for ordinary people so that they can, you know, actually invest and feel confident that their money is aligned with their values. Because, you know, the people who are my target population, you know, often don't invest at all because they have this deep sense that the market doesn't share their values. And so you have kind people who remain poor for no good reason. And, you know, that's really what I'm trying to counteract. And, and hopefully Invest Vegan can play a small role in making folks feel like there's a home for their, their money and their assets in the market so they can access the sort of stuff uh, that people who don't share their ethical concerns <laughs> do, you know, without feeling like they're kind of selling themselves out or compromising on their values. Let's pause and take a quick break. At the American College Center for Women in Financial Services, we're promoting the advancement of women in the industry through research, education, and awareness. Become one of our Women Working in Wealth ambassadors, keep up with our latest news and events, and learn how you can help break the bias at womencenter.theamericancollege.edu. Let's get back into our conversation with Sloan. I think what's amazing about your platform is you help people put their money where their heart is, where other places it's like putting their money where their mouth is. And I think it's so important that people feel confident in what they're investing in. For some of our listeners that may be slightly more novice, could you go into what sustainable investing or ESG or SRI, like what does that actually mean? You know, the funny thing about sustainable investing, ESG and SRI is that newer investors are like, what does that mean? But the most advanced investors are also like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, like I just had, you know, somebody from a really large California pension plan who's like runs billions of dollars in their sustainable portfolio talk about what it means to them. And they are really stuck defining a lot of stuff from the ground up, just like a lot of individuals are, right? So, you know, I think let's go through these three big, I guess, kind of things that people might Google. Socially responsible investing, SRI, is I think of that as what the clients ask for, right? The client comes in and, and there's, they're like, look, 
I don't want to do murder by accident. I don't want to profit from prison labor. I want help thinking about this. That's SRI. It's broad. It's the client intent, you know, of the whole thing. ESG is the industry's transposition of that. <laughs> If that makes sense, right? So the, the, you know, the client comes into the industry and says, hey, I want socially responsible investing. The industry thinks about it, and then they spit out ESG as a response. ESG is a type of investing discipline that takes into account environmental, that's the E, social, that's the S, and governance, that's the G, related factors in investment decision making. Now, when you say takes into account, what does that mean? Very good question. <laughs> Lots of, you know, implementation practices vary widely on this. You'll see things that are labeled as ESG that have like massive investments in oil companies. Uh, I mean, there are out there like quote unquote ESG funds that are functionally very, very similar to normal funds. They just have a higher fee attached to them. So I think of ESG as the broadest and most like manufactured version of the response to client demand for socially responsible investment products. Impact investing is a very, very interesting subspecialty of this, where typically I think of impact investing as being investing in private companies that align with a particular thesis. So I've seen folks that are focused on this from the standpoint of like making it easier to be an organic farmer, right? So like we'll lend to a farmer and help them do this, or, you know, people who are targeting investments in less developed communities that might, you know, kind of create jobs locally targeting, you know, kind of specific types of founders. I'm an advisor to what could be called an impact investment group called Colorful Capital that targets investments in LGBT founders specifically. You know, so impact investing usually involves going, I want to make some kind of impact, a specific kind, and then I'm going to find investments that do that. More broadly, though, all investments have impact. You know, it's just a question of like, are we going to take it into account and are we going to consider that they matter? You know, and I, I think that the industry is starting to do a better job reckoning with kind of the broader societal and I, you know, I guess legitimacy concerns that people have with a lot of big companies. And I'm really interested to see where the industry goes with it over the next five years. I think it's been a site of incredible innovation recently. Right. It's definitely been a catalyst for change. And you see a lot of these funds popping up. And as an investor, sometimes you're thinking like, which one should I really go into? And mm. how can I like complete my due diligence? And even as an advisor, as selecting specific funds, how am I supposed to know if someone whips up uh, an ESG fund, but their underlying holdings uh, are companies that you would not think of that are <laughs> ESG. Um, Hey, this is Chris. I'm one of the producers of the podcast. Sloan, one of the pushbacks we constantly get with these alternative funds and these mutual funds is the returns. So are you actually having clients who say, you know what, I'm okay with making less? You know, I would say that, that that's a really interesting question. And I, I think that, you know, there are a couple of different parts of it, right? You know, first of is, you know, our philosophy about risk, right? So, you know, is risk underperforming in a given quarter or is risk a more long-term thing? So I, I think that for my clients, they're, they're generally given to believe that climate change is real, you know, and so on and so forth. And that, you know, there are new business models emerging that, you know, make reality out of that. So they're more inclined to see the risk of investing in a traditional strategy as creating like stranded assets for them, right? Like investing in oil companies and stuff like that. Is that really sustainable? As a practical matter, though, the reason I named the firm Invest Vegan is because I wanted to attract clients who literally did not care what the market did this month, this quarter, even to some extent this year, right? You know, I don't really care if, what, if the market's up or down. I don't even care if the market's open. I just want to make sure that we're able to hold things that we can feel comfortable with on the long term. So I think that it's traditional to see it, to go, oh, that's a sustainable fund that's going to create all kinds of return, tracking error versus a benchmark, this, that, and the other thing. But the oldest tradition in investment management is benchmark agnostic portfolio construction, right? These benchmarks are dreamed up by guys in bow ties sitting in meeting rooms in Midtown that may or may not share our values. And, you know, if you are a vegan like I am, I, I think it becomes kind of hard to go, okay, well, if I simply gave up my worldview, <laughs> I could have captured all of these extra returns, you know? So I think that in the short term, you know, it's important to create buy-in with your clients, regardless of whether your strategy is like a far deviation from the benchmark or not. It's important to get them feeling comfortable with holding it for the long term. And that's what alignment with their worldview does. 
I do wonder about the age of the investors that you seek and who seek you. I'm 60. I'm not in for the long play. I, I need to have these reserves ready for me in 10 years, whatever, 12 years, 15 years. You know, a 28 year old, well, I've got that play. So is that defining some of your market as well? Not really. I mean, the, you know, I, I think that when I say like invest vegan, a lot of people think of like Beyond Meat and a couple of like sort of highfalutin, high tech, low profit, low durability kind of franchises that are out there. But I'm investing in recycling plants. I'm investing in clean water infrastructure, in affordable housing, in things that are really quite predictable in terms of their the path of returns. I do have tools as part of my kind of like set of strategies that can dial the risk up or down, you know, as might suit a traditional 80, 20, 60, 40 kind of approach. But actually most of my clients buy assets, I'm talking off the cuff here, but I would say three quarters are over 60. So- you know, I think what you're doing at Invest Vegan is such a unique lens to investing. And I'm very hopeful that other firms will adopt, you know, those philosophies, but kind of with the democratization of investing and becoming kind of this broad-based passive world that it's been for the last decade of this bull market, people don't necessarily know what they're investing in. And they are also apprehensive of not going with like a broad-based index fund, so a collection of stocks or a collection of bonds, because they think they're going to lose out on return. And then you're kind of perpetuating this issue, right, of non-sustainable investing and not necessarily making a change or a difference. So my next question would be, how could someone or an advisor invest differently? And what steps do they need to take? Honestly, like, you know, there are people out there who are like veganism, <laughs> you know, and there are people out there who, who might find various attributes of the way that I invest to be not the greatest and that's fine, but substantially anybody who's going to formulate their own approach to investing needs to find, you know, some sort of help developing their own philosophy. Right. And I actually wrote a book about this while I was at CFA Institute, the CFA Institute investment idea generation guide that's free and it's out there for everyone. And, you know, my, my co-author, uh, Jason Voss is a really celebrated, you know, uh, mutual fund manager. Who's like <laughs> also a literal ninja, uh, which is pretty cool. But what we do in that book is we, we help people kind of go and take the disparate pieces of information that they relate to at a deep level and turn those into a worldview and then move from that worldview into their own descriptive statements of the way that the world works and how they want to invest within it. And there are frameworks inside of that book that I use consistently throughout my life. And so I would say that that is a good place to start. But more broadly than that, I, you know, I think the most important thing to underline is that to invest differently, you must be willing to pay attention. That doesn't mean that you need to do a lot of stuff, right? Like I, when I was a kid, I had this impression of investment managers that we were like trading all the time. And that like, I think at one point I left an internship and I was like, when I grow up and I run my own firm, I'm going to know what the market's going to do every day when I go home. And I'm going to be like, tomorrow it's going to be up tomorrow. It's going to be down, you know, cut forward to now I trade once a month, literally. And I don't even trade that much when I trade once a month. So I think that there's a difference between paying attention and doing stuff that you need to be able to navigate. And the best advice I can give people is that if, you know, if they're drawn to a particular area or a particular type of information or fact pattern, that they should really go into that. I mean, like I read, you know, probably more than a hundred individual publications every month. I don't read them in depth. I don't read every word, but I am always looking at these publications, like places like High Country News, the Texas Trib, Nikkei Asia, Al Bawawa in the Middle East, like, you know, and I'm just going, okay, so from a Middle Eastern business perspective, what does this mean, right? How are they covering the war in Ukraine? How are they covering inflation in the US and supply chains, right? And a lot of these tools are discussed in the book where we, you know, we sort of talk about how to, how to look at the news and make, make lists of news. But the best way to start investing differently is to broaden your worldview actively and pay disciplined attention to that on a regular basis. That cannot help but inform a differentiated investing perspective over time. Paying attention and being intentional. I think those are the two That's better, important way, things. Way better put than I, than I could have put it. That's great. Yeah. Concise, right? <laughs> um, I don't have time to read a hundred publications, so I don't know when you sleep or if you sleep. So I'm proud of you there, but 
going to slightly pivot with my next question. And I know about being intentional is really important to you. And I really want our listeners to also come away with ways that they can be allies for LGBTQIA plus community, which Mm -hmm. I know that you identify with. So maybe walk us through ways that people can be allies for that group. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's an interesting question because, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I should say I'm a queer trans woman and, you know, I uh, am packing proud of that. I mean, pe- people on the video can't see, but I've got, you know, the New York City skyline illuminated in, you know, the good old gay rainbow as my background as we're chatting. You know, I think that the biggest thing that straight allies or folks who intend to be allies can get hamstrung with is just the lack of familiarity, right? You know, I was at a bachelorette party with someone this past weekend and someone comes up to me and they're like, excuse me, I don't have many trans women in my circle. Can I ask you a question? Is it okay to ask your pronouns? And I thought that was the sweetest thing because first of all, of course, it's okay to ask pronouns. People love that. If you're at all confused about pronouns, you should ask them. And you know what? Ask everyone, not just people who appear trans. It will broaden your world in a big way. But it's not like the LGBT identity that folks have, it can be, I mean, in the instance of trans people like me, it has a lot of like kind of showbiz value attached to it because like, you know, I I was like living as a different person, (laughs) you know, for a period of time. And then there's this kind of big reveal or whatever, but that's not all of who I am, you know? And I, I think that there are intersectionalities in all of us to a bunch of different communities that people might not necessarily assume, right? Like, you know, if I, if, you know, if I told you off the bat that I'm like a vegan trans woman in Brooklyn, you might not assume that I'm also like an ethnic Mormon, you know, and, and that I have, you know, all of these friends and family members that are part of what a lot of people think of as a very conservative community. I think my trans identity and my Mormon identity are, are equally poorly understood, you know, so I, I would suggest that folks like start by going, okay, well, it's not about LGBT people specifically. It's not about even trans people specifically. It's about understanding the people that you encounter without preconception and making time to listen. So, uh, you know, I think that it's very, very hard as a practical matter. I know with, you know, transness specifically and pronouns and stuff like that, like, you know, when I first came out and I was changing my name, I called up, you know, Charles Schwab, where I I still have some personal money. And I was like, hey, I need to change my name because I just changed my name legally and I'm trans. And the guy on the other side of the phone was like, I just want to apologize in advance because I'm going to offend you. And like that, I mean, first of all, like I've told that story like a hundred times and I hope that I get the chance to talk to that guy at some point, but you know, that's just such a silly attitude, (laughs) you know, I mean, because like, how do you know you're going to offend someone unless you are like somehow committed to not listening to them, you know, as a practical matter, people misspeak, you know, and it's very, very easy to tell the difference between when somebody is like being actively bigoted and hateful versus being just a little bit starved for vocabulary. You know, and for anyone who's interested in a piece of reading material, I would recommend An Illustrated History of Queerness, you know, which is a great, great, great book on Amazon that goes through a lot of the theory and and practice and history of this without being like morose. A lot of time when you read about queerness, it's like, wow, AIDS killed all of us. Sad. You should be sad. You know, but anyway, so that like that would be a place to dive into for folks who are, I think, interested in, in expanding their horizons a little bit. I think it's such a great reminder of making time to listen, regardless of the group and regardless, you know, just finding that space and finding that commonality. Um, We are near the end here. So I'd love to ask you one last question. If you could go back to younger Sloan, what advice would you give her? Just transition, you idiot, I think would be probably the advice that I, I would give her, but that may not be as applicable to everyone. Related to that though, you know, I think that I've gone through a lot of things in my life that I felt would exclude me from the world and cut me off from other people, right? And I've found that, you know, as I've grown into, like, I'm now a very specific person, (laughs) um, you know, for better or worse. And I found that the more specific that I get, the more myself that I get, the more the world throws people back at me who want to be a part of that. And so, you know, I think that for folks who, you know, might be considering a career in financial services or career in investing that are worried about squaring, you know, the person that they are and the person that they need to be in order to, you know, make a home in this industry, I would say maybe the industry needs the person that that you are, not the person that you think you need to be right now. And it's perfectly acceptable 
to just put out a vibe and see what happens. 20 year old me would never listen to that message. <laughs> you know, but I really, really wish that she would. And uh, if, if someone out there is more enlightened at 20 than I was, I, I, I hope it comes through. I love how you said we can make a home within the industry and that you can be the person that you want to be and put out that energy and that vibe and you will find the people that will help you be who you need to be. So I absolutely love that. For our listeners that want to get in contact with you, Sloan, how can they, where can they find you? Well, so investvegan.org is where all the firm stuff is and free money podcast, free money with Sloan and Ashby is my, my podcast that comes out completely anarchically and irregularly, but there are about 50 out there that people can listen to. So those two breadcrumbs are probably the best places to start. Sounds perfect. Well, we appreciate your time and thank you for joining us for Women Working in Wealth. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us and please leave a rating and review. To keep up with future episodes, subscribe to our show and follow us at our Women Working in Wealth social channels. This has been Women Working in Wealth, brought to you by the American College of Financial Services. 